Hi again, folks, and welcome back to NTI's Japan Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Ziv Nakajima again. Great to have you with us today. Thanks for tuning in. Before we dive right into today's episode, and man, have we got a nice episode lined up for you today. Uh, just a quick heads up before that, on one of our uh, more recent episodes a few weeks ago, episode 69, I think it was, in which we discussed the details of those new investment loans uh, that people can use to buy Japanese investment properties with. Um, so a lot of people have contacted us after this one, um, same as, as with the first episode in that series, and one of the recurring questions seems to be regarding the minimum investment amount. So we have mentioned that, generally speaking, and there could be some occasional exceptions, especially for those living in Japan or Hong Kong, but the general uh, rule of thumb is the loan amount minimum needs to be 20 million Japanese yen, which is around 185,000 US dollars or roundabout at current rates. And a lot of you have been asking, and this is probably my own fault for not being clear enough about this, if those 20 million yens have to be invested in a single property or instead can they be spread out over a few of those? Uh, well, the answer to that one is unfortunately no. That amount cannot be spread out. It has to be a single loan per single property of 20 million Japanese yen or more. Now, I get the question we have mentioned here in the podcast um, time and time again in the past that the best rental yields actually come from smaller, older units, uh, usually in co-owned buildings or small buildings. And these cash cows, um, if you will, normally cost anywhere between 3 to 10 million yen per unit, um, slightly less than some of the smaller towns, slightly more in Tokyo or Osaka but generally somewhere within that range. So yes, it is true that properties that cost 20 million yen or more do tend to generate a lower rental income overall. Um, however, unfortunately, with the amount of paperwork involved uh, in the uh, broker and lender side of things, uh, they have decided that they're going to limit those loans to 20 million yen per property. That's just the way it is. Uh, the upside of, of that is that these properties normally do have a larger land portion attached to them. So you do stand to gain uh, far more if and when any appreciation occurs. And really because you are leveraging with the loan, your cash on cash return is far higher, meaning the monthly net income after you've taken care of all payments, including the loan installments themselves, is far higher as a percentage of the money you've actually put down out of pocket than it would be if you were to put it up all in cash. So that often goes to the double digits cash on cash. And so the lower net yield becomes um, a bit less of an issue with financing. And as we mentioned, you still need to put down that minimum of uh, uh, 55,000 US dollars or so, uh, so 30% roughly of the purchase amount, even with that minimum loan amount of 185K. So if you've got, say, $100,000 cash saved up to invest with, you can actually separate and hedge that by uh, using half or slightly more of that as a cash deposit for the loan. And that's for the bigger property. And then use the remaining cash to buy one smaller older unit in cash that you own outright. And then that process actually gets you a bit of hedging and diversity because you now own two properties, different class, probably in a different geographical area or socioeconomic profile. And as we all know, when you invest any kind of money, diversity and hedging are one of the best ways to maximize profits and most importantly, to minimize losses by giving yourself uh, exposure to as many different market sectors and investment vehicles as possible. And this kind of investment strategy talk actually leads us to today's episode, which is really going to be a conversation with Mr. Ben Tanaka. Now, Ben is a university lecturer in Sendai, Japan, probably very well known to his colleagues and students, and probably equally well known to students and teachers at uh, Cambridge Academy, which is an academic uh, English program run by his wife's English school, um, which is designed and still functions as an advisor for and also trains the teachers. However, it's his other hat that we're interested in for the purpose of this podcast. And that hat under which he's known uh, as to equally as many people, if not more, is that of the Retire Japan online blog, of which he's the founder and main writer. Now, for those of you who haven't immediately gone, ah, that Ben, retirejapan.com is probably the only and definitely the most comprehensive resource in English for anything to do with personal finance, retirement, and general financial betterment uh, that's specifically focused on Japan and people who are living here. And the blog and its um, sister Facebook group are packed full of constantly updated within depth articles and guides and news and just general information to do with those topics. And it's also a very lively and supportive community of folks who are either, like Ben himself, passionate about personal finance or have got some experience in this field. Um, but maybe we should better get it directly from the horse's mouth. Ben is with us on the line. Thanks so much for joining us today, Ben. Great to have you on the show. Hi, Zev. It's really good to be here today. 
So after this long-winded introduction, and before we actually go into um, personal finance, and um, could we maybe dig into uh, your own background a bit? Because you're a bit of a uh, global grasshopper, aren't you? You're originally born in Germany, I think, grew up in Spain, but you actually hold a UK passport as well, and you lived in Japan most of your life. So um, I'm getting a bit lost. Can you run us through all of that? <laughs> sure. Um, so my parents are British. Um, I was born in Germany, lived there for a couple of years. So I left when I was two. Uh, went back to England for a bit, uh, then moved to Spain for eight years. So I was there for elementary school. Um, then went to England for uh, high school and university. Uh, had a year in China uh, and then came to Japan from there. Um, I actually came to Japan on jet. I figured this would be a short visit, maybe two years. Uh, I think a lot of people come here like that. Yeah, I have heard that before. <laughs> Uh, and then, of course, I met my wife, and um, two years turned into 20, uh, and just trying to, to weather that transition from, oh, I'm going to come here as a kind of extended gap year, to, oh, I actually live here now. Um, I ended up working lots of different jobs. So I was a Jet ALT, I worked for the Board of Education as an advisor. Um, I worked uh, part-time at English schools and so on. Um, I was a wedding priest for about oh. six years on the side. Um, what else? I, I did uh, editing and, and writing for large uh, educational companies. Um, and then, basically, uh, I had three really uh, significant experiences that really got me thinking about money. Um, and the first was when what I thought was a, a safe and permanent job suddenly turned into unemployment. Ooh. So I was working at the Board of Education. Um, when I joined, they said, yeah, you're on a one year rolling contract, but you can basically stay as long as you want. Uh, and then four years later, it was like, oh, sorry, we're not gonna renew your contract in four months time. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> that was very traumatic. Mm -hmm. um, and at that point, I kind of said to myself, look, I don't want to be in this situation ever again where someone else's decision has, has a, a, a large impact on, on myself and my family. Um, the second experience was a bit better. Um, I got an inheritance uh, from my grandparents, um, but I didn't manage it very well. So pretty quickly, there, there wasn't much left right. <laughs> of the inheritance. And I was like, ah, okay, that could have gone better. Right? Do you enjoy well, it at least gone. now? <laughs> What's that? Did you enjoy it at least? Did you enjoy the money? I think I'd, I'd, if, if I got it now, <laughs> <laughs> the results would be quite different, I think. Mm. Um, and then the final experience, of course, was the earthquake in 2011. Right. Here in Sendai. Um, and we actually ended up evacuating. Um, it was really strange. Like, the phone lines were down after the earthquake, right? The no, no phone calls were, were possible on landlines. But for some reason, I got two phone calls from Europe the day after the earthquake on these deadlines. I'm not quite sure how that worked. That's but, spooky. Um, yeah. <laughs> and both of them were, were to warn us about the, the situation at the nuclear power plant, Yeah. which, of course, we knew nothing about on the ground. Yeah. Uh, and I kind of made a decision there, right, we have to leave right now, because if we wait, you know, that the roads will be possibly blocked. So we left... In 30 minutes, actually, my family just grabbed stuff and we went to Kanazawa, where we oh, had wow. relatives. And we stayed there for a month. But the, the real takeaway for me there was that all the stuff we left behind uh, didn't really matter. You know, I wasn't particularly, you know, possibly never to return. It, it really didn't seem very important. And that, that really got me started on a kind of minimalist kind of uh, philosophy. Right. Yeah. And did you um did you have any kids at this point? Yeah, I've got three stepdaughters. So okay. there were five of us and we took my wife's parents with us as well. Right. So when we say and stuff we're talking about material stuff, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well once the the family's all safe, it was like, okay, then you know, books, CDs, televisions and stuff really not very important at all. Right, and that's when you started thinking about, what, saving money, personal finance, or did you immediately think about, um, what, retire Japan, a blog, or how did that come about? <laughs> no, no, it was 
was um, it was all of that really. It was how do I want to use my money? How can I make my financial situation more stable? How can I grow our wealth? I guess uh, for the future. Um, actually, the 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 the, re- the thing that really triggered it for me was um, my wife's ex husband um, sent her a book about the predecessor to the IDECO scheme, which is a defined contribution pension. Uh, And this was for, at the time, it was only for kind of self-employed people, entrepreneurs and so on. Uh, And he sent her a book about it. She didn't read it. It was on the shelf somewhere. Uh, And I just picked it up and and slowly made my way through it. And it kind of blew my mind on, on how useful the information was. Yeah. Um, And that kind of got me started um, thinking about sharing information with people. Uh, And the reason that the website was born, actually, was I was talking to a friend of mine who, he's an English teacher, he's been an English teacher for a long time, Uh, he was in his 50s at the time, and he was telling me about his investments, which were through a company in Tokyo. Okay. Um, one of these companies that basically does financial management for expats. The ones that actually are directly to invest in stuff that they get commissions for. Exactly. Yeah, so yeah, the, yeah. the type of company that calls you up yeah. uh, and sells you uh, some products that are much better for them than for you. Yeah. Uh, and just talking to my friend, I got so angry at the situation he was in, through no fault of his own really, um, that I went home registered the website and wrote the first blog post that night. <laughs> <laughs> That's the retired Japan came from. So you, <laughs> you decided to go troll. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've been careful not to be libelous or, yeah. or stuff. But I do want to warn people that uh, it's very important to understand uh, what you're doing. Uh, right. Especially if someone's trying to persuade you to do something. I mean, and you've done a fantastic job. I mean, it's been like what, six, seven years, and um, not, not to ruffle your feathers, but the width and the depth of the stuff that you've got on there is just phenomenal. I mean, I was looking at a uh, digest from a couple of weeks ago, and you touch on, well, I mean, obviously the stuff we'd expect, like micro, macro economy, financial topics, like, you know, U.S. stock market and salaries and pensions and retirement expenses, um, but you've also got um, stuff like the effects of emotion on investment, you dealt with uh, in cryptocurrency, and you go even deeper than that. You talk about digital detox, and uh, what a big Tokyo earthquake can do to global financial markets, and just some general life lessons, and uh, climate change, geopolitical climate and energy. I mean, not all of that is stuff that you, you've personally written, but you definitely do collect and collate some really thought-provoking contact on the website, don't you? Yeah, I've got a lot of help, to be honest. Um, I mean, I, I probably read too much online already, uh, and I, I kind of post stuff that I find interesting. Um, but also readers from the site send me articles all the time um, to add to you know the Facebook page and the, the Weekly Digest and so on. Yeah. Uh, I think one of the best things about the site, one of the things I'm most proud of is the community we have that mm. is just so knowledgeable. I mean, I'm learning stuff every day from these guys um, and so supportive. You know, there's really very little unpleasantness in the retired Japan crowd. And I'm really proud of that. You know, we're all kind of in there to help each other uh, and not to put people down. And, and, you know, if someone comes in who knows nothing, that's fine. We're happy to, you know, get you started kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, that, that group in itself, I mean, aside from the official contact, that group is, is an amazing wealth of information. And like you say, the experience and the knowledge of some of the people out there and the way that they uh, dish that out to people who don't have that, um, you know, someone's wondering about something and there's someone out there who can immediately, and usually they do, they give some very good advice. So, I mean, do you see any topics coming up uh, time and again in your experience? Like any messages that you keep delivering again and again, preaching on? Well, my, my standard um, sermon on the blog is um, you start off saying you've got to take responsibility. Like we sometimes get people who say things like, oh, you know, I'm, 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 my job's not good enough or my, I have to spend money on my family or um, being in Japan makes it difficult to do things. And, and all of those may be true, but I think at the end of the day, you have to take responsibility for your situation. Mm. Uh, whatever difficulties you have then you have to overcome them 
right? Whatever your situation, there's something you can do, right? This kind of helplessness is, isn't very helpful for anyone. Um, so that's the first thing. And then, then we always say, just start small. You know, there's no need to go out and, and transform your life overnight. Just, just start with a small uh, monthly saving amount and take it from there. Um, and it's really important to understand what you're doing. Uh, we, we touched on that earlier, but basically anything that's complicated that you don't understand is probably too dangerous for mm. you to jump into, all right? Um, and then there's the standard financial advice. So spend less than you earn, uh, invest the difference, uh, and then, you know, in 20, 30 years' time, uh, you can send me a nice thank you email <laughs> when you're very comfortable. <laughs> Yeah, and, and that's, I mean, that is basic. And when you say invest, we, I mean, we can diversify and hedge and experiment and trial stuff, but it's really those core principles. I mean, like us, for example, we're mainly about real estate property here because this is what we know and this is what we're experienced with and comfortable with. So when we talk investment, it usually revolves around those topics, but then you can hedge within whichever, whichever sector you're invested in. You can always hedge and diversify in there. And whatever you find yourself drawn to, I mean, investment-wise, and there's probably a way in there somehow that you can better yourself financially if you focus on that, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, basically, what you were talking about earlier, you know, diversification, mm -hmm. which is not putting all your eggs in one basket. You know, don't just buy one hot stock, for example. Um, I think the, the kind of poster child for this is uh, one of my wife's relatives who was working for an airline at the time. Um, and his wife put all their money into that airline stock. Right. And that airline happened to go bankrupt, so the stock went to zero, he was laid off, and basically they, they went from being very well off and uncomfortable to, you know, struggling. That's terrible. Very, and that was a complete lack of diversification, mm -hmm. <laughs> basically. That, that's horrible. And, and I agree, I mean, wh whatever your sector is, you have to strike that balance and between education and experimentation. I mean, any investment will carry some risk, um, but you definitely shouldn't be jumping into it and throwing money at it without understanding it well enough to recognize those risks. Um, and on the other hand, that some people don't really invest, though, right? They collect those um, savings, let's say, and they put them in a term deposit or under the mattress, as we used to say, and just sit on the fence and read and think about what to invest in and waiting for the right time, the right climate. I mean, at some point, you do have to start doing something, don't you? Yes, yeah, I think starting is, is the main sticking point for, for a lot of people because um, they're scared or, or they've been put off. And especially here in Japan, where I think this is a, a kind of hangover from the bubble years, but in society on in general, like for most normal people, investing is, is kind of scary, it's kind of dangerous. Um, it's it's really risky. So often, if you have a, a Japanese spouse, for example, um, they will be pretty much against any kind of stock market investing or, or that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> so I think it's it's really easy to say, oh yeah, we should do that someday, <laughs> but and someday never comes. So that that's really true, and that that's probably a good note to end on uh, too. Um, folks, if there's anyone out there who, like Ben was saying, is still sitting on the fence, wondering, concerned, hesitating, um, definitely advice to go to retirejapan.com. Retirejapan.com, definitely one of the best places to start just educating yourself and just getting some advice and encouragement uh, from people who have taken that step. And again, their Facebook group, the online community, is really a, one of those best places to get that interactive advice aside from all the reading obviously completely free of charge and again people who've been through the same experiences they're not in any way interested in cashing in on you just good people with good advice and they're happy to give it um ben thanks but before we let you go just one thing i really wanted to ask um i was browsing your resume and aside from all those accomplishments uh, that you obviously racked up and the places that you visited and lived in um you actually originally planned to be in the sis the british Cir secret service i think Yes. <laughs> um, so when I when I was a kid, I wanted to be a vet originally. Right. Um, but I then found out I wasn't very good at science, and being a vet in in the UK is is one of the most 
challenging and, and uh, competitive jobs there is. It's much harder to become a vet than to become a doctor, for example. Really? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so around the age of 15, I was like, okay, so this isn't going to happen for me. So, so what do I want to do? And I thought, well, I'm good at languages. Um, I like traveling, you know. Um, Just be a secret agent then. <laughs> yeah, why not? And um, at, at the time, you know, this, this was a while ago, um, there was no public, there wasn't even a public recognition of SIS, this is MI6 in, in layman's terms, yeah. but uh, so they didn't exist officially in a way, yeah. um, they certainly didn't have any way to apply to them, so the way it worked is you had to be noticed by one of their recruiters who were dotted around society. <laughs> So what, you take on uh, you take on contract jobs on your own and hope they see you. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the wrong kind of attention. No, basically, I was at university, and I think I figured out who the SIS contact was. Uh, so I went up to him and said, you know, I'd really be interested in in working for the the government uh, in an international role. And he looked at me and he said, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> But about two weeks later, I got a brown envelope with uh, "On Her Majesty's Service" stamped on it. Oh my god! She took me to an interview, so I, I think I did find the right person at the time. <laughs> um, and so I went to a, a nondescript building in central London. Uh, went up, went in. There was a, a guy sitting on a reception desk, and I said, uh, "So um, I'm here for an interview." And he was like, "Just sit there." And I had a nice chat with someone. And they said, we love the... This was after I decided to come to Japan as well. So I was, I was already kind of uh, committed to coming on jet. And they said to me, look, we love, we love the idea that you're going to Japan. Go to Japan, learn Japanese. And when you come back, uh, come in and have another interview. So obviously I never went back. <laughs> ah, okay. So that, that's still in the books, is it? It's <laughs> the Asian Korea. And of course now there's a website. So you can apply online if you're yeah. interested. <laughs> progress. It's not as interesting now, perhaps, but a bit, bit more accessible. And they probably got a bigger uh, talent pool this way. I don't know. I think it makes more sense. Mm. More jobs available. Well, you never know how things might turn out, right? I mean, there's definitely still a place for that um, in your future somewhere. Uh, with your experience, you know. <laughs> Doesn't work out, yeah. <laughs> You know, we might still read about you in the papers a few years, a uh, decade. Oh, probably wouldn't know that we're reading about you, wouldn't we? Okay. Nice. Well, th thanks so much for your time again, Ben. I really appreciate you talking to us today. And I think our listeners, especially those who are living here in Japan and um, considering moving here in the future, are so much better for it. So thank you again. No, thank you, Ziv. Um, I've also been learning a lot of, about real estate from your articles, this podcast. Um, your series that you wrote for the Retired Japan blog, about um, investing in real estate in Japan. It's still one of the, the best things we have on there, I think. So thank you very much for your efforts to uh, spread knowledge and, and help people. No, thank you. That's very flattering. Much appreciated. Um, folks, on this same topic, talking about saving money, if anyone is investing in, uh, saving in more than one currency, whether it's Japanese yen, US dollars, pound, Australian, Singaporean, whatever, you've got any sort of financial interest in more than one country, you probably move funds around anyway, whatever frequency transaction size. Do yourselves a favor, stop using international bank transfers on your online banking system. You are losing at least 3% to 4% on each transaction, and probably a lot more in the most cases, um, and just sign up with a Forex provider. Plenty of good ones out there, and we're not talking about, when we say Forex provider, this is not PayPal or Western Union and so forth, so these work for smaller amounts, but if you're transferring a few hundred dollars or more, open an account with um, our partner OFX or TransferWise or any of the other internationally renowned Forex providers, you'll be saving yourself heaps of money. And we've mentioned here in the past that we work with OFX, we're going to keep hammering that in, we've been with them for about eight years now, and you can actually sign up through our own partner referral link, which is going to be in the episode show notes. What's good about OFX, aside from the fact that the rates are really much better uh, than the banks and that the transactions are free of any fees, if you use our partnership link, which we'll put again, um, they've also got a 24-7 help desk that you can call with any questions, requests, last-minute changes. Um, that one's actually saved my own personal butt on more than a few occasions. Um, after I booked a transfer, accidentally clicked the wrong currency or amount or something of that sort. Um, with other providers, I'm sorry to say, but from our customer's experience, you can pretty much go fish. But OFX are the only ones that I know of that are actually there for you, and they can accommodate your call any time of the day and night, and they can actually cancel or amend the transaction if uh, not too long has passed since you booked it. And that's really nothing short of amazing. 
So thanks again for tuning in, folks, and thank you again to Ben for offering this uh, time and his expertise to us today. Just reminding you once again about our seminar at the end of next month in Akasaka, Tokyo. For the price of one drink, you can get not only the drink, but also two and a half hours of me hammering into your brain. No, just kidding. Some of the um, best real estate property investment advice you'll find, honestly, anywhere in Japan. Not just from myself, but from another expert as well, Paul Feinberg. And we'd love to see you with us, and we are running out of seated space. So RSVP today. That link, as well as, of course, the link to Ben's blog, retirejapan.com, and the Facebook groups of Retire Japan will be in this episode's show notes. Hope to have you with us next time. Have a great day or night, wherever in the world you're tuning in from. And until next time, from all of us here at NTI and Retire Japan, we wish you, as always, happy investing.